Today's customers don't just want products or services. They want unique experiences they can't get anywhere else. They want to be delighted at every touch point and any time you can go the extra mile to make it even more special, you'll gain loyalty. And if you handle a complaint effectively, you could get a customer for life. Today's episodes is about how you handle those complaints. This is the Vacation Rental Success Podcast, keeping you up to date with news, views, information and resources on this rapidly changing short-term rental business. I'm your host, Heather Bayer, and with 25 years of experience in this industry, I'm making sure you know what's hot, what's not, what's new and what will help make your business a success. Welcome to another episode of the Vacation Rental Success Podcast. This is your host, Heather Bayer. And as ever, I am hugely delighted to be back with you again. And here we are, sort of middle of August now. We're on the downward trend towards the end of the season. Although I know for most of us, the season is going on. It's, you know, heading on into September, October. And yeah, I'm not sure we're actually going to slow down a huge amount as we get into September. But there is that sort of, there is a thing, you know, you get that feeling when Labor Day comes and the fall starts to arrive And people, I don't know, people always seem to be a little bit more mellow around about that time. Whether they are this year, well, that remains to be seen. So it's been a really interesting summer so far. And I've mentioned a number of times in the last few weeks that since we've introduced text messaging to our portfolio of communication and some other communication input, it seems like our level of complaints has plummeted, really has compared to previous years. I mean, we're having the busiest summer ever, but it just does not seem like it. We used to talk about the 80-20 rule and now maybe it's the 90-10 rule, but maybe actually even the 95-5 rule. The 5% of our guests are giving us 95% of the grief, but the grief is not that bad. And at risk of repeating myself over and over again, it seems the level of communication, the higher level of communication that you have with your guests, the less likely they are to make complaints at the end of their stay because they've been given the opportunity at many different touch points along the way to feed back to you, to let you know if something's going wrong, to let you know if they're not happy. Having said that, you know, some of the issues are major to these guests and they will continue to make complaints regardless of how many times you send them a text or send them an email or even make a phone call. Some people are just not wired to be happy. So I talked a few months ago about customer service and the skills we need to handle a range of situations And it was an episode that I called uh, Revolutionize Your Customer Service with the Starbucks Formula. So I will put a link to that episode because I think that's a good one to, if you haven't listened to that one before, it's more of an overview of our whole customer service strategy. And in this episode, I want to drill down a little bit more into things like handling complaints, empathy, Ways to apologize when you have screwed up, because let's face it, we all do that at some time. So I've got lots of examples in this one, many of which you've probably experienced yourself. And I'm also going to talk a little bit about serial complainers and how we recognize them, how we handle them. We've had two really good examples of serial complainers where they, it was so clear way back at the time of booking that these guests were going to be an issue that on both the occasions of these examples that I will talk about, the guests made it very clear in their early communications that they were going to be a problem when they got to the property. And indeed they were. They'd both been flagged 
in our PMS as the potential for being a serial complainer. And they did not disappoint. We were right. So I'll be talking a little bit about those as well. So complaints, you know, it's dealing with complaints is time consuming and it's stressful. It's stressful on everybody involved. And I'm sure whether you're an independent operator or you're a manager, there's times when you've gone to bed at night worried because you know something's going to happen. You know, when you wake up the following morning, there's likely to be an email or a text message or a phone call to say, I'm not happy. And what are you going to do about it? So I want to talk here about some ways of dealing with these issues in a really efficient and calm manner and just explore some of the ways that you can manage unhappy guests. So in doing this, I mean, I'm not coming at it and you know how Pollyanna-ish I am. I am the supreme optimist. The glass is always full. Forget half full. The glass is always full. But I do know there's times when you might not want to have guests back at all. It's just worthwhile letting them go. So I'm going to touch on that too. So let's kick off with a couple of established facts we have about dealing with guests and owners in this business. And number one here is everyone is unique and every person, every guest is going to perceive a situation in a different way. So we've had a couple of issues about dishwashers in the past week. And the first one was a guest who went into a brand new property. Now, we were down to the wire on this one because it was, in fact, the listing still shows the architect's designs of the property because we haven't even been able to get in there and get the final photos. But we posted this architect's designs on the listing and the amenities that there would be way back in March, April time. And we had um, some bookings, two bookings one for three weeks, and then we we got one for the end of the summer. So all the way along over the past six months or so, I've been going back to these guests every so often, letting them know about the progress of the construction. You know, clearly we know with COVID, things have been delayed, de- deliveries have been delayed, etc. So all the time I was checking back with the owner and asking her how the construction was going on and getting really positive responses every time that they were ahead of schedule and everything was going to go according to plan. So I'd been telling the guest who was going in at the beginning of August for three weeks that I would get there and take photos. Unfortunately, that just never happened because they did get so down to the wire that the owner was still cleaning and staging right before the guests went in on the Friday of check-in. So I, I'd contacted him and said, I'm sorry, I have not been able to get down, but it will be ready for you. So he arrives and he has huge expectations. Unfortunately, I did hear on that final day, just before the guests went in, that the doors they expected to be delivered for, some of the doors they expected to be delivered had not arrived. So on that very final day, there was a contractor in putting in just temporary doors. There was nothing wrong with the doors. They just weren't the handmade custom doors or whatever that the owner had had planned to put in. So I'd let the guest know that and he was not happy. And then they checked in and I had an email to say, we're here. The place is fabulous. That was the first thing. The place is fabulous. However, we're not happy about a few things. One of which was these doors weren't finished, which in fact, from what I understand, didn't take anything away from the property. They were just standard doors. But I think letting the guests know that the custom doors hadn't been delivered had probably been a mistake. I think if we'd not informed him, he would have been fine. However, the big issue was that the dishwasher wasn't working. And we had heard from the owner on that day that they'd they'd been running the dishwasher the previous two weeks before the guests went in. Because um, I forgot to mention, you know, the contractors had finished two weeks previously. The owners had moved into it and they'd spent two weeks preparing it for their first guests. So, you know, this, this wasn't that down to the wire, I guess. But she called us on a couple of hours before the guest was due to arrive and said, the dishwasher's not 
working. She said, I don't know what's happening. We're trying to get somebody in to, to look at it. And, and I don't know what we can do. And, and we had this discussion with her and said, well, look, you know, let's provide paper plates and, um, things that, that the guest can, can use in the interim while we're waiting for the appliance repair. And I let the guest know. And that was, that was a first indicator that we might have some issues during the guest's stay because the response was, this is absolutely intolerable. We cannot be without a dishwasher during our stay. You must fix this now. And I don't know if any of you have been out there trying to get appliances. It really is difficult. It's difficult to get any appliances delivered, ordered. You know, up here in Canada, they're on or in Ontario, there's back orders for months. I have one other cottage that has had some renovations and they've been waiting six months for their delivery of a dishwasher. So we were having to deal with, you know, handle this upset guest about this dishwasher. At the same time, another owner found out that their dishwasher wasn't working. They went to do the changeover. Dishwasher was full of dirty dishes from the from the guests that had just departed. And there's something clearly wrong with a switch. There's power going to it. However, the on button isn't working. So it's, it you know, just feels like there's a connection broken. So the first thing the owner wanted us to do is let, let her guests know that the dishwasher's were not working. So here we go again. <laughs> Let's share this wonderful news with a guest. And the response we got was, oh, I'm so sorry for the owner having to deal with this. Absolutely no problem for us. We've got four teenagers with us and that will keep them off their devices. Just chalk and cheese, just entirely different perceptions of exactly the same situation. And I just love to use that example because this is, this is what we see on so many occasions that we have some guests who are super tolerant and some who the smallest issue is going to send them into a drama that we'll have to deal with. So here's another example. And this is a recent email. While we we're at the cottage, we saw a mouse. It was so cute. We couldn't bring ourselves to put a trap down, but the owners might want to check it out on the changeover. Now, this to us is, is a cottage guest who has been to cottage country before, understands that mice exist. If you leave a screen door open, I'm sure there's a group of mice waiting outside every open cottage door, just waiting for somebody to move away so that they can gain entry on every changeover. But this guest really wasn't bothered. And I love it. It was so cute. And they couldn't bring themselves to put a trap down. And then in the same week, we get a call to say, we're so, we saw a mouse and we are disgusted. You would rent us a cottage that allows this to happen. Some of those, I, I, I have to, I have to take a step back and, and realize that people coming from the city who have perhaps never come into contact with any form of wildlife are going to find that it's, it's something that they have to grapple with and handle it because it is so different from what they're used to. But that's just a, that's just another example about how unique and different guests are. And another one, we've had some power outages recently and the text message from one. And in fact, this was a, this was a situation that occurred recently. A power went out in a property. It was 36 hours before the power came back on and it didn't come back on until the guests who were in there had left. So these lovely, lovely couple, this lovely set of guests were there for 36 hours without power. They had to flush toilets by bringing water up from the lake and pouring it into, into the uh, toilet tanks. They had to go into town and get bottled water. And the owner gave them a $150 voucher to go and eat out, although they seemed quite happy to be barbecuing. But they, they really took it all in their stride. And when they left, they left the note that said the power was still out when we left and we were so sorry we couldn't do the dishes. And the guest was quite distraught because she said, 
I always leave properties in, in an amazing condition. And I'm so sorry I wasn't able to do it on this occasion, but we did tidy up as best we could. The owner said it was the most amazing changeover they've ever done. And they did that entire changeover without power. But kudos to those guests. We also went back to the guests and gave them a $200 voucher for the next stay with us because we loved them and we want them to come back. So the contrast to that is the guest who contacted us and said the power went, the power just went out and I need it back on right away because my phone wasn't charged and I can't do any work and I need to do work while I'm on vacation. So that's just another example of, you know, the same situation and different, completely different reactions and responses to it. So the second established fact about dealing with guests is that there are those who see themselves as victims and you as the owner or as the agency have actually created a situation that causes them to have a lousy time. And in fact, for many of the issues we've dealt with this summer with our 5%, maybe less of unhappy guests, it's because, you know, you see it in every communication from them that we have done this to them. And the best one, I think, is just happened last week, was a family that went to a cottage and they were visited by geese every day. You know, our wonderful Canadian geese who do come by and they do leave a ton of leftovers on the lawn and on the dock. And so the guests contacted us when they got there and said, there's been loads of geese here. There's loads of, there's goose poo on the lawn and it's all across the deck. So the owner went there or, or we got a maintenance man in and he hosed down the deck, mowed the lawn and let it dry there's not a great deal you can do about goose poop on the lawn. I mean, nobody's going to go with poop bags and pick up 300 plus piles of goose poop. So they did the best and said to the guests, look, the best thing you can do is be as active as you can outside. So when you go out in the morning, go straight down to the dock. If there's any, sho- uh, if there's any geese on there, shoo them off and you know, have the children play on the grass. They refused to do that. They didn't really want to spend that much time down at the water. They were enjoying, I say enjoying, I don't think they enjoyed any part of it. They were up around the, um, the house itself. So the geese kept coming back and that was our fault. And we're currently dealing with a very lengthy complaint about the geese and why this, these guests need to be fully compensated for a ruined vacation that these geese caused. For any of you who've listened to this podcast for some time, you'll probably recall my previous goose story about the goose that died on the lawn and the guests re- refused to go outside until somebody had come along and disposed of the body. You know, by the time we got somebody out, out to do it, the goose carcass had been destroyed by the raccoons. So that that was probably even more distressing for them. <laughs> but um, yeah, geese are an issue. And we have a clause in our terms and conditions of rental that say you won't get a refund or a rebate for any situation caused by the local wildlife, whether it be insects, whether it will be animals or birds, because they are a part of the fabric of this type of vacation. Unfortunately, people don't read terms and conditions. So we're dealing with that at the moment. But these these are guests who clearly see themselves as as victims and we did it to them. One of our serial complainers, which I'll go into in a little bit more detail in a, in a few minutes, arrived at a property with, with a lot of food, put it in the fridge, overloaded it. And what happened, we know any of you who've ever had a fridge break down and had that call from the guest to say, the fridge isn't working. It's not cooling my food. You know that they've loaded it up with warm food uh, turn the thermostat down because they think that if you do that, it will cool quicker, which of course it doesn't. All it does is freeze up the compressor and the only, the, the only resolution for it is to take everything out, defrost it entirely and start from scratch. This guest complained that, you know, it, it, it was not her fault this fridge was broken and it had to be replaced immediately. But she was doing, she she firmly put herself in victim role and that we'd done it to her. 
And then maybe we've had some neighbor issues where on one occasion, a neighbor has done something. Maybe they've had uh, a party or their boats have been a bit loud as they've gone away from a dock and the guests have complained and asked for a refund because part of their vacation was spoiled by the fact that we put them next to these unruly neighbors. And of course, the neighbors are often other guests, rental guests from other companies or from owners who are operating through platforms independently. We have no control over that. But the victim mentality says we've done this to them. So those are facts. Those are facts that everybody is unique and there are those who will see themselves as victims and there's not a great deal you can do about it. And there will be some for whom, for, for whom no recovery is possible at all. You know, it seems they're, they're determined to have a bad time, whatever you do. And they're determined that when they get to their, at the end of their bad time, they're going to ask for some money back. So what can you do? All you can do is do your best to be kind, to be empathetic and to be fair, being fair to every party. So we're going to talk about those three things, being kind, being empathetic and being fair, because it's all, that's all about what good customer service is. Even if you feel that you are being treated unfairly and examples of good customer service experiences are more often than not the result of a kind customer centric staff who are good at these following things. Now, when I say customer centric staff, it could, if you're an independent owner, it could be just you. And if you're delivering good customer service, you are good at number one, responding quickly, always respond quickly. The more time that elapses between somebody making a complaint and having that response, the more difficult the solution is going to be. So having that quick response will encourage the customer to appreciate that. They'll appreciate fast response times more than anything else. And that's often what we we hear at the end of somebody's stay. You know, I had a problem, but it was dealt with really, really quickly. I've said it over and over again. I'm going to say it again. Breezeway text is the best thing that's happened to us this year because people can highlight an issue and we deal with it straight away. So the second thing is acting on, on that feedback. Whatever you get from a guest is acting on it. You're going to act on it straight away. And when you act on that feedback and tell a guest that you, you've actually taken an action because of it, they feel that their opinion has mattered. And that goes a long way to recover a situation because it's, while it's always great to get positive feedback because it feels warm and fuzzy, negative comments, even when you think they're really unjustified, can highlight things that you can change and then you let them know you're going to make a change because of them. So your quick response is your first route to recovery. Then it's all about showing empathy. So when you try to understand your guests' point of view, they're far more likely to feel valued. And empathy means trying to see a situation how they see it. And this year, um, and I'm sure you will all agree with this, it's all been about having the perfect vacation. Everybody wants the perfect vacation. They've spent months anticipating what it would be like. So when it doesn't work out, it can have dramatic effects. And you you can tell those dramatic effects when you see some of the feedback that you're getting and something goes wrong and, and the vacation is, air quotes, ruined, air quotes, I'm devastated. People are using strong emotional language to describe their negative reaction. So it's so important to have that empathy to get in their shoes and understand that they're feeling that feeling. Because when you do that, it makes it so much easier to respond to it. I, and I, I think I, I, I'm sure I have told this story before when we used to have Osprey Cottage, which was my favorite, favorite cottage on a beautiful river. And uh, it's been sold about 10 years now, but I, I still remember that as being my flagship, flagship property. 
we had three, it had three bedrooms and two bedrooms had queens and the third one had bunk beds and it had a double bunk. No, it didn't. No, it had twin bunks. My cleaner had complained on a number of occasions because she was, she was getting on a little bit and she said, I can't climb up that ladder to make that upper bunk. Is there any chance that we could separate out those, those bunk beds? So we did. We thought this was a fantastic idea. We took down the bunk beds and we separated them and made it into a really nice twin room. And what we forgot to do was change it on the listing. We didn't make a change on the listing to tell people that the bunk beds were no longer bunk beds and it was now a twin bedded room. We just went along and thought everybody would be just as happy. And then I got an angry, angry phone call from a guest who had just checked in to say, I can't believe you've done this. My son is devastated because for the months leading up to their vacation, her seven-year-old son had been told that he was going to get the upper bunk bed. He'd never had a bunk bed. He'd always dreamt and longed to have one and they just didn't have one at home because he was, it was just the only child. So what was the point of having bunk beds? So they had promised him that when they came to Osprey, he would get the upper bunk bed. And apparently he was so excited about it when they arrived, there are no bunk beds. To say they were devastated? I mean, I was pretty devastated too. I had not even considered that we would have that reaction. So it was actually quite easy to get into that customer's shoes and apply the empathy. It allowed me to create a stronger connection with that, with that guest because I was able to say to her, you are so right. We have made a big mistake here. What can we do? I understand how disappointed. I appreciate how disappointed your son must be. My grandchild would have been exactly the same. And it was, it was about just offering the most sincere apology. Unfortunately, when we had taken the bunk beds apart, we had removed and probably disposed of all the connecting pieces that would have allowed us to put the twin beds back up as, as bunks. So we could not recover the situation in terms of making those bunk beds whole again. So we had, we said to the customer, we said to the guest, what can we do to make this better for your son? We can't recreate these bunk beds. We made a huge mistake and I'm so sorry about this. And you know, quite honestly, I can't remember what we did. I think the other thing that he, he wanted was to go fishing and they had asked about fishing license and how to fish in the river or something like that. And I'm pretty sure we bought a fishing kit for him, paid for the fishing license and bought some bait, took it all down to the cottage. And, you know, like, like seven-year-olds, they, they get over these things very, very quickly. But it didn't take away from that parent feeling awful that her son was so distressed when he arrived. But it, it might have been easy to become defensive about it, to say, you know, well, you didn't tell us how important it was to him. Uh, we were simply thinking that we were making it easy for everybody to have twin beds instead of a bunk bed. That would have been really easy to do. But instead, the empathy allowed us to reflect back to the guest that we understood how distressing they felt it was for them. I mean, some of the empathy statements, and I, I may or may not have used them, but some empathy statements that you could use can have some really great effects because you're validating the customer's, the guest's concerned, and you can demonstrate that you understand the situation entirely. And, and because of that, you do make the stronger connection with the guest because of it. So the statements would be, you're right. You are so right. So that immediately defuses a situation because you're not being defensive. You're just simply coming back and saying, yes, you are right. We made a mistake. 
Another one is, I'm so sorry you've had to deal with this. That's a lovely empathetic statement. You're getting on their wavelength. Another one is, can I just check? I'm understanding this correctly. And then feeding back what they've just said. So feeding back what people are complaining about is also a good way of diffusing a situation. Because if you have understood it and you have fed it back correctly, they're going to come back to you and say, yes, you're right. You've got it. So you're, you're beginning to get in agreement. So just say, may I check that I'm understanding the problem you're having correctly and then feeding it back to them is, is a very useful technique. And then another one, and I've used this a lot, I appreciate you're disappointed. I would be too. That's putting yourself in their shoes. And the way I put it with, with this lady was, I, you know, I appreciate how disappointed your son is. My grandchildren would have been disappointed too if they'd been looking forward to this so much. And the expectations, I guess, weren't met. Um, it, was a, it was a tough one to deal with because there were a lot of tears going on in that situation. But we were able to, uh, we were able to resolve it. And at, at the end, we got a fantastic review from these guests. So I've just mentioned apologizing. So I want to talk a bit more about that because sometimes we screw up. Sometimes we have to say we're sorry when we don't feel it's necessary because, and we have to suspend being offended as well and take the, take the high ground, I guess. So you suspend being offended and just replace with being kind to people. And then of course, as you know, the things that you have to apologize for because mistakes happen errors occur. Something wasn't there that should have been. Something breaks down. It can't be fixed. And whatever the reason, you have to apologize to your guest. And there are ways of doing this because all too often just saying, I'm so sorry, isn't going to cut it. And for those of you who've got kids or have grandkids, you know what they're like when they say sorry. It's just, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Or yeah, I'm sorry. It means nothing. You have to make your apology matter. You have to make it so that it comes across as being sincere. And I know that's difficult sometimes when you you really think, the back of your mind, I have nothing to apologize for. But what you're saying sorry for really is how this guest has perceived something. And that really, that does matter. So, Apologizing effectively can be done almost with a formula. And the first part of the formula is conveying understanding. And I I just mentioned that when talking about empathy, because in, in the first part of an apology, you're going to use that, those empathy techniques. You know, if I'm understanding you correctly, and then you paraphrase their complaint, I understand how frustrating how disappointing, how upsetting this problem has been for you. Again, it's, it's apologizing using empathy. So that's the first thing is convey that you understand how they're perceiving this situation. And then it's number two is to accept responsibility. Don't hide from the responsibility if you've actually made an error or don't shift the blame. That's really important. And use apology statements such as, you know, I'm I'm so sorry you had to deal with the noise from the neighbors. I'm sorry we failed to let you know we'd taken down the bunk beds and you've had to deal with the outcome. I'm sorry this failure on our part has impacted you and your vacation. So just take that responsibility because it really does impact the way that the situation is going to unfold. Thirdly, you explain why the problem occurred. This can be a little more complex because you've got to explain why a problem occurred without being defensive. So for example, so the situation happened because we did this or didn't do that. And to prevent it from happening again, this is what we're going to do. So there are complaints you'll get about things that maybe are 
completely relevant and understandable why the guest is complaining, but you can't do anything about it for them. But you will make a change so in, to ensure it doesn't happen for, for the next guests coming in. And I always think it's worth telling them that you are making a change. So with the bunk bed example, we created the twin bedded room because it made it easier for the cleaner and really regret that we did not let you know beforehand. We have now changed the listing to show it. Another example is we we care deeply about your vacation experience. And on this occasion, we failed to meet our regular quality standards. We should have been more careful. And I'm very sorry for the issues it caused you. That's just a a really deep and heartfelt apology. And then finally, always end your apology by showing some gratitude to the guests for bringing the situation to your attention in the first place. So I'm deeply sorry this has happened to you. It's not the experience we wanted any of our guests to have. Thank you so much for bringing it to our attention and allowing us to address it. People like being thanked for for their feedback. Another one, thank you for bearing with us through this incident. If there's anything else I can help you with, please let me know. I like using that one. Thank you for bearing with us through this situation. You know, if something has been a little bit ongoing, maybe it's an appliance repair. When you thank them for something they have done that's made your life easier, it makes them feel good. You've thanked them for their altruism, I guess, and for their forbearance. And it really makes them feel good. And that's what this is all about, is making people who've had a situation that you have to apologize for feel good. While we're on the topic of of apologies, let's look at some anti-apology statements as well. And, And I see these a lot. I'm sorry, but I was taught that years ago in customer service. You never use the word, but I'm sorry for the situation, but this is why I'm not sorry, basically because it makes a statement an excuse, not an apology. And when you say, I'm sorry, but it just tells the customer you aren't interested in helping them or really taking responsibility. The other one, I'm sure we've all used it at some time. I'm sorry you feel that way. I'm sorry you feel that way. What that says is you aren't accepting responsibility or even recognizing there's a problem or issue that you need to to fix. You're simply, you're not getting in their shoes. You're saying, Mm, you think about it differently from how I think about it and you're wrong. And the third one is we apologize for the inconvenience. I say it that way because that's, <laughs> if you ever see that written you would and you read it out, that's the way you'd say it. We apologize for the inconvenience because it sounds so insincere. It's not personal. It's just robotic. It's unfit for any purpose. You know, it's just, a, it's, it's a canned apology and it should never, ever be used. So there you are. That's, that's, you know, apologizing, how to apologize and how not to apologize. I can't finish today without talking about serial complainers. There are a whole, I don't know whether you call it a forum on Reddit. There are whole sections on Reddit, which tell people how to complain and how to get money back. And in, in different situations. I haven't come across one. I'm quite sure there's one somewhere that tells guests, probably it's Airbnb, tells Airbnb guests how to get money back from Airbnb. But the thing is, is that these people, these serial complainers let you know, they always let you know at some point that they are this type of person. They, it, Often it's a complete setup. And to give an example, I talked earlier about the fridge and the lady with lots of food to go in the fridge. At the time of booking, she sent us an email and to ask about the property. And it was a a very, it's a high end property. It's one of our most expensive properties And it comes with the amenities that go with that style of property. And her email said, I need a reliable fridge that will not break down as I'm bringing nearly $1,500 worth of food. It's very important to us to make sure it is operational for our entire stay. So this is the lady, as you may recall, 
who brought her $1,500 worth of food and completely overloaded the fridge. It didn't actually stop working. In fact, throughout her stay, the refrigerator kept working, but it caused the compressor or the fan to make a banging noise every time it came on. And, and that disturbed their entire stay. And I just felt for everyone involved in this because she didn't let up the entire week that she knew her $1,500 worth of food was going to be ruined. And she wanted to know what refund she was going to get back for, for the awful stay they'd had because this noise that the fridge was making during the stay. So, so what transpired with this one is that we know that uh, this is how, what, what happens with the fridge when it's overloaded. So uh, we offered to go and take a small, couple of small fridges to put all her food in while the big fridge was defrosted and we started from scratch and she refused that. That would, of course, have, have resolved the issue, but she didn't want to have anybody in the property while they were there. And there were a number of other fixes that we offered that she turned down. And this is one of the ones that we've said, never again, we're not giving you money back and you will not darken our doorstep again, if you like. Uh, Another one we got earlier in the season was, can you tell me how efficient the AC is? I have an elderly relative who must have consistently good air conditioning. So we have learned over the years to recognise the sign of a serial complainer. And each time we get this experience, we just rebuild the way we uh, respond to that initial recognition. So for example, and and one of the part of, of dealing with a serial complainer is being prepared. So, you know, your team should always know if somebody recognizes this. So everybody knows it. Let them know when you see a setup and flag it as such. And then have disclaimers in writing. So for example, with the with the email that we had about the fridge, we should have gone back and we will in future go back to the guests and say, while the appliances will be in working order when you arrive, please note the optimum use of them as described in the guest guide. For example, overloading a fridge with warm food could cause a compressor issue that might take the refrigerator out of use while it is defrosted. So it is reading into the setup when it starts and just letting the guest know that you have things in place to deal with a situation should it arise. You can, of course, with a serial complainer, give them a quick win. They will consume your time. Um, more often than not, they, they're going to take up to take hours complaining. And we've had a couple of those this week with the what we call the laundry list of, of complaints. And we have spent a lot of time on them. Because that first initial response is to not want to let people get away with it. We don't want to let them get away with it and give them anything that, that might support their habit of, of complaining. But you know, you will never change another person. You cannot change somebody else's lifelong mission to be unhappy and to be a complainer. And it's not your job to change someone's personality. Your job is to make your life as easy as as you can. And if that means refunding them something, making sure they never book with you again, and it gives you an easier life, then do it. Give the money back. As long as it won't cost you too much, it's better to just let them win than to spend too much time on a standoff with them. Understanding goes a long way. It's true that some of these people complain about everything, but still try to listen as some, some of their concerns may well be valid. Understand why they're complaining. Try and put yourself in their shoes. And the feedback might help you avoid those encounters in the future. We learn from every complaint that we have. And remember, you can't please everyone. Some people refuse to be pleased. You may risk a bad review, but they're going to write a bad review anyway. They're going to be negative, whatever. Even if you think you want to spend the time winning them over, if it's not possible to do it, don't beat yourself up. 
and just move on. Don't let them get to you. Because giving up and accepting defeat are two very different things. So if, if all of these things I've talked about don't work and the guest is not somebody you want back, you might just, just, just consider letting them go. Just let them go. Okay, that's about all I have to say about complaint handling. We, we use so many of these techniques throughout the course of a season. And as we get into August, it, it becomes much easier to do so. I tend to start, start the season pretty tense, waiting for all these things to happen. And, and then as I get into August and we get to the middle of August, it's like, oh, yes, yes, just, just give them some money back. Have them go away. And anything, and I'm, I've used it twice this week, anything for a quiet life. So I hope that helps with your future complaint handling. I'd, I'd love to hear, always love to hear how you, you know, what situations you have, how you deal with them. I am going to write a book one day about all the crazy things that we've experienced, the crazy complaints, the odd ones, the unique ones. So I need lots of, uh, lots of examples. So as you know, if you want to get a hold of me, you can email me at heather at vacationrentalformula.com. And I'd love it if you write a review about the podcast and let other people know how much you're enjoying it. I'm assuming if you've got to this point, you might just be enjoying it. (laughs) And now we're on to episode 402 and we'll be steaming ahead to our 1 million downloads. I want to make sure we get some more listeners in. So the more reviews we get, the more listeners we get to the show. If you have any ideas for a future show, somebody you'd like me to interview, if you want me to interview you and you've got a great story to tell, please let me know. Send me an email at heather at vacationrentalformula.com, like I just said, and, uh, and I'll get in touch with you. So for now, I'm recording this on a Saturday. Uh, just about three hours from check-in. So I'm going to get back to the computer, get back to the office, see how we can make for another super easy changeover week. And uh, yes, can you see? That's my glass full, not even half full. That's my glass full. We're going to have a great, great day and I hope you do too. It's been a pleasure as ever being with you. If there's anything you'd like to comment on, then join the conversation on the show notes for the episode at vacationrentalformula.com. We'd love to hear from you. And I look forward to being with you again next week.